Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rio2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, uh, the Self Liberator's Paradise. Uh, to learn more about the Second Realm Parallel Network uh, built upon a foundation of truth, peace, and voluntarism, just visit PasniaPazNIA.com uh, or consider joining our Pasnia Committee of Correspondence on Telegram. Uh, that's t.me forward slash Pasnia Chat. Uh, we got, uh, you know, 155 members or something in there now. Um, it's uh, pretty active and uh, it's a good place to be, so definitely hop in there. Um, and uh, we also do have our first gathering of the year, uh, of year three, uh, 2023, coming up. Um, all vetted Pasnians and self liberators are encouraged to attend our spring gathering from April 13th to 17th. Uh, we'll do some land processing like we do at most. Uh, we'll have some homestead projects if anyone is looking to contribute their labor uh, to the second realm or maybe work towards a stakeholder membership because we do obviously encourage barter and um, and the, the, the work is uh, definitely appreciated. And uh, maybe most excitingly, uh, we'll be starting our, our electroculture projects here. Um, that is, we'll be wrapping, our co- we'll be wrapping uh, copper around 10 to 12 foot uh, bamboo antennas and then connecting them to buried copper wire uh, seven inches into the ground. Uh, it's not new at all, but the results uh, I've, I've seen have been quite magnificent. Uh, so we're starting with heirloom tobacco. Uh, so it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun. Anyway, I hope to see you there. And if you need help getting vetted, uh, email coordinator at pasnia.com, uh, or again find me on Telegram. Anyway, without further ado, today I welcome back SW, co-founder of Samurai Wallets. Uh, last time we chatted was June fifteenth, twenty twenty-two, episode one fifty-seven of the podcast. Uh, and a lot has happened. In the Bitcoin space since then, uh, and being the most innovative privacy wallet out there, uh, SW and uh, TDEV and the crew have been busy. Uh, I also have to recount an extremely positive experience I had with our customer support. Uh, without going into the really boring details, even that I'm not really sure I understand yet. I'm going to do another test on it um, when I get another BTC pay server transaction. But yeah, within the span of 15 to 20 minutes, uh, I had a way to re- resecure Bitcoin I thought I might have lost. So uh, considering the fact that customer support is basically terrible nowadays in general, um, a nightmare even, I always regret having to reach out. Um, I was super pleased um, with this aspect of Samurai too. Uh, so t- today we'll get a rundown um, We'll uh, give a rundown of the extensive privacy features already on Samurai, uh, their efforts towards decentralizing Whirlpool. Uh, we'll get into some philosophical ground pertaining to privacy, pseudonyms, and security culture. Uh, we'll get his take on the Tornado Cash situation. Uh, you'll learn about the various ways Samurai Wallet can be used offline uh, for cold storage setups and uh, whatever else we get to. So uh, without further ado, SW, welcome back to the uh, Vanu podcast. Uh, how are you doing this morning? Thanks for having me back, Shane. It's good to be here. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And... Um, yeah, it, has, it hasn't been that long. It feels like it's been a lot longer, but a lot has a really a lot has really happened um, just in the past, you know, six months or so. So I'm um, excited to have you on and uh, you know get your uh, you know your your input on all those things. But um, I guess uh, we, we we covered your story and background in our first discussion. Uh, so I would recommend new folks go sure. check that out. Um, and I guess this this first question I have to kind of get us started off on a philosoph- more philosophical note. I guess um, I guess it might it might pertain well, before your, before we it, jump in. I just yeah. want to say. Um... I'm happy to hear that you had a positive experience with our support team. Um, we have we decided really early on actually to invest heavily in the support experience for for users, uh, and this year we're able to do almost 24 hour, uh, seven day a week support, um, totally free of charge. Users could uh, chat with us on live chat uh, or email, and we should be able to get back to you very quickly with a solution um i think it's the only only wallet in the entire space that has anything like that so i'm very happy to hear you had a positive experience because it means that that investment is paying off oh yeah no it it, it definitely is um it definitely is i mean it's like like i I said earlier the customer support is kind of a lost uh (laughs) it's lost nowadays um it's, it's been my experience so um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. Um, you know, an open source, you know, an open source privacy focused Bitcoin project, um, non traditional. Um, so yeah, we talked about you, you when you needed to raise money, you did it. You know, using using Bitcoin, I think colored coins. Um, you did it. You've done it all kind of uh, in the second realm. So the fact that you're able to do that, um, I mean, it's 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 really incredible. Um, and I guess a, a good sign that uh, you know, obviously the whirlpool fee, whirlpool fees are coming in, and uh, lots of new people coming into the ecosystem. So um, yeah, all good stuff. <clears throat> Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, like I, I uh, so yeah, I guess to, to get more philosophical here before we get into 
um, I guess the specifics of, of uh, samurai and some some I guess some news. Um, and it could pertain to your, I guess, your background and story too. But um, I just want to give you a, g a general question here. Um, I guess the the importance of privacy pseudonyms and security culture practices um, in this day and age, and I guess why why you th why privacy is well, you know first and foremost to you. Why pseudonyms are um, you know must use. Um, I guess tell us tell us a bit about that if you could. Uh, yeah, I mean it's always been important, right? But I think it's even more important uh, more recently as the um, <clears throat> surveillance capabilities have increased dramatically, um, being able to put together bunches of uh, disparate pieces of information uh, into one identity is far easier than it was, you know, even five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, so, so operating under a pseudonym at least provides, or even maybe multiple pseudonyms, at least provides protection in the form of, you know, various identities doing uh, various things in their own silos. Uh, it's more important than ever to protect your, you know, your metadata, uh, your transactions, your location history, everything, uh, because it, it can all be uh, put together and shared uh, in a comprehensive database um, in a way that can be very detrimental to uh, your real privacy, uh, your mm -hmm. real liberty. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... It, you know, it's not just about transactional privacy to us, which is what we focus on with Samurai Wallet. It's 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 a broader, uh, uh, you know, that's one that's just one piece of the puzzle, and that's what we're able to contribute, you know, to the broader struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and um, I guess uh, like this stuff, yeah, ten years ago, you could get away with, uh, um, you could maybe get get a little more away with, um, you know, not caring too much about digital privacy and not having it seep into your you know, actual, you know, physical life. But, um, right. yeah, it's not uh, really possible anymore. Like, the two are so intricately tied um, that, uh, yeah, you have to care about it or else, I mean, I I've, I've, I was listening to, um, I can't remember what podcast it was now, but uh, the, the the couple of people were talking about, like, I can't even imagine, like, t imagine 10 years down the road. I mean, it's kind of already this way, but it's only getting worse with all the data breaches and such. But when everything is public forever, um, and there's no way to put the cap, you know, back in the bag, you know, um, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's all out. So, like, I, I don't think... Um, like the the philosophical implications of that, I'm not really quite sure um, how that's gonna look in the future. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely definitely important. And I guess to speak to pseudonyms real quick, it's not, it's a realization I've had, um, or I guess from experience. But uh, when you only connect, when you only talk to people like through pseudonyms, um, like even me, like with with some of the people in the Pasadena network, like if I don't talk to them for like six months, it's like I know it's one of these like two or three people. I'm not sure which one. They're all vetted. But uh, we'll just roll with it. Um, so, like, even yeah. so, it adds a lot of. Um, so, like, if you're looking at it from um, kind of that uh, that counter, um, you know, counter standpoint, like you're, you're countering something. Um, I can only imagine how confusing that would be to, um, you know, would be coercers or um, or privacy violators or whatever. So, um, yeah, I'm realizing that more of the utility of, of pseudonyms. But uh, um, yeah, anything yeah, else? Yeah, yeah, being able to being able to you know create a an identity at will. For, for anything is one of the, you know, most fundamental aspects of, um, you know, it, well, I, I gave a talk about it at one of the Monero uh, digital conferences. Uh, they had me give a talk and I, it was about the uh, cre creating a digital safe haven. You know, um, in, in the past you had Switzerland, which was kind of considered a monetary safe haven. This is obviously no longer true today, but in the past you could open bank accounts and there was strong legal protection for bank privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and the talk was about creating that, you know, in the digital digital realm. And one of the primary, you know, aspects of creating that in the digital realm is the ability to create new identities or pseudonyms, you know, freely and at will. And at Samurai, we really consider um, the BIP47 payment code or the PayNim uh, as a possible fundamental identity piece in a broader, um, you know, Bitcoin based ecosystem that is, you know, um, you can digitally sign as proof of being that payment, but also it's cheap and well, free to create. Uh, and, you know, so you can create them at will. So, you know, yeah, basically all of that to say that, you know, the, the ability to create new identities uh, at any time for various transactions or various dealings is a fundamental part of a, uh, the the free market. 
Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you made an interesting point there. I hadn't really thought about that, but potentially using yeah using a paynim as um, I guess people are kind of doing with with uh, like Lightning and Noster now. But um, regardless, um, like using the paynim as um, I guess uh, well, like use that as the identity, like the you know the pseudonym, and then build up a reputation around that. And then as you said, you can always just like with any with any other pseudonym, you can always just start over. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting right interesting exactly. Idea. Yeah, and, and, and just because it's just that, you know, that's more of a, the idea around the pain and as being powerful, whether we, we actually realize it is another story. And, um, you know, I, I think maybe we're, we're realizing 10% of the power of pain right now. You know, mm -hmm. we can do a lot more with them. And, you know, I think we, we plan on doing a lot more with them. Uh, but, you know, as you mentioned, there's, you know, lightning, there's no stir, there's all these other things uh, that, that facilitate the same kind of idea, right? Um, in terms of creating identities um, mm -hmm. easily without, you know, without, without friction, without barrier, whether that be, you know, state barrier, like KYC, um, you know, identity laws uh, or uh, monetary, monetary barrier, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's as free and open as possible to create these new, new identities. And I think it's great to see that there's other things in the works because mm -hmm. uh, it, it needs to be available. Yeah, yeah. So I guess on that note, I'll 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 ask for a more basic explanation of that um, when we do I do kind of a brief overview for just for any new new listeners, five or ten minutes, just running through the features of Samurai. But before that, we're talking about Panems right now. Um, I guess in our last conversation, I remember um, we uh, you were talking about how really there was no other, or I guess it was it was kind of uh, opposed from the start. People didn't really like it because I guess uh, some some core developers uh, voiced opinions on it or something of something of the sort. Um, I guess what's the progress on Paynim adoption today? Um, I guess yeah, how's how's the I guess how's the progression of that going? Oh, we're we're very pre uh, pleased with the progression. Uh, so as you know, we implemented it in 2015. Um, we were the uh, the first to implement it, and we kind of were the only one to have it for quite a while, um, until uh, Sparrow Wallet, and I believe it was. 2020 but it might have been end of 2019 I don't, i'm not i'm not sure they also then implemented um bit 47 pay names as well as the um uh, collaborative spend tools that we developed that kind of can use the pay name architecture as well uh and that really kind of showed the wider market that you know it's easy to implement this tech and it's such a win for users that it's harebrained not to like, you know, it, there's no reason not to do it. Um, yeah, there's trade-offs with everything and you can hem and haul, you know, all day long, but it's proven tech now since 2015. Um, we have over, you know, on our end over a hundred thousand, uh, paintings in the wild, just from Samurai wallet alone. Uh, and that's only growing now. And I think it was announced, you know, just a couple of days ago that it's going to be implemented into blue wallet. Um, it's also been implemented on iOS in something called stack wallet, which is a multi-coin wallet, uh, but they implemented it in their Bitcoin section. Uh, so, you know, 2023 looks like it's the year of paying them. It, it, it's coming into way more wallets and that's only positive for, you know, all users of those wallets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you mentioned Sparrow Wallets. Um, I have to give a, a shout out to that one too. I've been using that for for six or seven months or so. Um, and um, yep, yeah, it's a super stuff. super slick wallet. Um, it makes you feel like a really powerful Bitcoin user with all the information you have at your fingertips. It's it's quite amazing. And the and the, gra the actual graphs are all there, and it's 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 pretty incredible. Um, and then obviously it's it's easier to if you aren't running your own you know node, um, then it's hard to remix. Um, you know, remakes from the from the Android. So um, Sparrow, um, the remixes sure. are, are, are great on there. Um, and uh, see, I, I, I can't recommend Sparrow enough. Uh, do you have any anything anything uh, to add on Sparrow? And I I guess um, I guess I guess interoperability with with uh, Whirlpool and, and the Samurai features and things. Yeah, sure. I mean, Sparrow is a fantastic desktop wallet. Um, you know, we have always been focused on mobile, but we are always like wondering why. <laughs> You know, no one has created the good desktop wallet. You know, there hasn't been anything good since, you know, Electrum, which was kind of ancient at this point, right? And then and then Craig came along with Sparrow, showed how you could make a great uh, power user wallet without it being too overwhelming for ordinary people. 
um, and unlock all the you know functionality that you, you can do on desktop uh, more easily and efficiently than on mobile where you're kind of limited. Uh, so when he reached out and said that he wanted to implement a Whirlpool, we were more than happy to, mm -hmm. to do whatever we could to help him out, get it in there. Um, you know, we made some changes on our end uh, to the code to accommodate Sparrow. He made some changes on his end. It was a really good um, working relationship and it developed into, um, you know, him not only uh, implementing a Whirlpool, but like I said, implementing uh, Paynims, implementing uh, Stonewall, uh, implementing Stonewall, um, uh, uh, Two person stonewall, sorry, and stowaway. So, you know, the feature, the, the Postmix tool set um, is identical in Samurai Wallet and in Sparrow Wallet, which uh, is, is powerful from an anonymity uh, set point of view, um, because now you have two wallets that are independent in their own implementation that now share the same feature set uh, mm -hmm. between two. Uh, largely independent user groups. One is mobile, one is desktop. So you're now introducing more of these, you know, these transactions into the into the wild. Uh, and some of them, especially like stow, uh, stowaway transactions are important to be disseminated into the wild because um, they're, they're difficult to detect as, um, as anything, you know, uh, it's a steganographic transaction. So it looks ordinary, but you know, hidden inside it is is uh, anything but ordinary. <laughs> Amazing, and that's uh, that's actually a perfect segue. So I think uh, um, this would be a great five to ten minute extra video um, for this podcast, and even just a good overview for uh, people for Samurai. Um, but uh, could you run? Could you provide a brief rundown? Um, you know, a minute or two for each um, of the features of Samurai. Um, you know, just moving down the, the features list on the on the SW website. Uh, could you tell people what what Stonewall transactions are? Sure. Yeah. So a stonewall transaction, um, well, there's two types of stonewall transactions. There's a stonewall and a two person stonewall, uh, both the stonewall and the two person stonewall look exactly the same on the blockchain. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about them as, you know, uh, as if they were one, and then I can kind of dissect what the difference is in a second. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a type of transaction that introduces doubt into the composition of who owns the inputs, uh, who owns the outputs and who's paying who between input and output. Uh, so a simple, so it's a, it's a uh, coin selection strategy. Uh, a simple transaction uses the least amount of um, inputs and the least amount of outputs. Um, so if you have uh, one input and two outputs, that's, that's, that's typically what we call a simple transaction. And it's pretty clear, um, the input that paid, uh, and the destination, the output, uh, with a stone wall, there are decoy outputs introduced, multiple inputs used, uh, and amounts that are, um, made uh, identical to it. Uh, all in an, uh, in an aid to increase the number of combinations between input and output. Uh, we call it the entropy of the transaction. Um, reduce the amount of what we call deterministic links. That means can be 100% uh, linked between input and output by introducing doubt and bringing that number down from 100% to maybe 33% or maybe less. Um, is it one of one of a few um tools in the arsenal this tool it sticks out but it it reliably adds confusion to make uh to make any kind of prediction whether that be uh just someone in general looking on the blockchain or whether that be an adversarial uh you know chain analysis um researching this it it, it makes it without uh it reduces the probability, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what, from what can be a hundred percent deterministic, hundred percent fact to something down to 33%, you know, or even lower. So to us, that's like a, that's a nice win. Um, Stonewall X2 looks, like I said, it looks exactly the same, has the same exact, um, properties, but actually uses a second person to create the transaction. Um, so instead of you creating decoys, outputs, 
someone else someone else's outputs are used and you swap them creating a mini coin join type of thing right right yeah that's uh that's great that's uh, a fan i don't i'm not sure if i've uh i'm not sure if i've done a stonewall transaction yet um but uh yeah anyway what's uh what's uh and this is i, I forgot so, about so these, stonewall okay. is stonewall is enabled by default in both you know um the regular portion of the wallet and the the whirlpool post mix area of the wallet oh, okay uh, if it can be enabled it will be enabled and you it's up to you you can disable it okay so we probably err on the side it. of yeah we err on the side of a strong default yeah uh uh strong default privacy uh, the the trade-off with stonewall is that it, it will cost a little bit more uh, transaction fees because it's just a it's a bigger transaction mm -hmm. uh so you know that's the trade-off that's why we allow users to turn it off if they want to but by default if it can be created it will be mm -hmm. there's additional rules in terms of which which utxos are selected i didn't want to get into that but uh it, you know your wallet can't always in, uh, do a stonewall transaction so mm -hmm. um yeah in that case it would be disabled yeah that okay yeah that actually yeah i that I, that, that comes to mind now yeah um yeah and uh, i guess the wh whether it's stonewall or the ricochet um, I do notice, but I mean, it's, it's like you, you're paying for a valuable service. So yeah, it's going to cost, you know, it's going to cost money. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've noticed, yeah, ricochets, I don't do them all the time, but probably about 20% of my transactions are ricochets just depending upon who it's to and you know, how much, uh, you know, sure. just, yeah, situational. Yeah. But, they're useful. You know, like it, the, that's the thing about all of our features, right? They're, they're, we don't advertise anything as, you know, a silver bullet. They're all useful tools with um you know a focused area like ricochet can be incredibly useful but only to the right you know uh, right people uh right merchants right you know, places like i wouldn't send a ricochet to you right <laughs> and you, you probably wouldn't send a ricochet to me um if we were transacting together we would choose to do something different something better for the job mm -hmm. uh and, and that's the thing about samurai there's a lot of tools um there's a lot of things that either we've developed we've uh, come up with um or you know things that are just kind of going on in the background um and learning to understand what each portion of and that's the most challenging part of samurai i think it, it, it's it's relatively easy to use um and it's getting better all the time but there is so much um behind the scenes that are going on that it would help you know it would help users to know about and learn about and say okay this is a perfect time to use a stowaway, for example, or this is a perfect time to do a join bot transaction. And um, that just comes with time and with use. And I, you know, one of the reasons why I like you doing this podcast in particular with, uh, with Shane is because you, your users and you, I know actually use the wallet mm -hmm. and, you know, it's more than just, you know, uh, receive and then never open it again. You're in, you know, kind of day to day, month to month using using this stuff and mm -hmm. that's a that's the type of user that we're focused on and i think we're successful because those types of users really appreciate having the tool set available to them right um that you wouldn't really get with like just a storage focused wallet right and this stuff didn't like uh as far as like user friendliness and like these you're like these tools in particular obviously like a lot of this stuff if you've been in the privacy space like i've been using jitsi since 2014 2015 um but uh um yeah it's like this a lot of this stuff didn't exist so the fact that it's there like and i if i can and i can pay for it like that's fantastic just the fact that it exists is is the is the, the miracle in of itself um so that's the i guess that's that's uh yeah that's that's huge and we, we've been talking about ricochet um i guess ricochet is on the list too um essentially that's just um ricocheting the transaction off different um wallet addresses right is there any any other nuance or anything that you like to add there yeah, no, I mean, that's pretty much it. It's pretty straightforward. There's, I mean, it can get a little deeper, but the the idea behind Ricochet is we know one of the main strategies um, that are in, in use at uh, centralized exchanges in particular, but really any regulated entity, is that they look at the history of your coins about five, four or five hops backwards, right? So if there's something against uh, in their terms of service, like, you know, uh, online gambling, for example, um, if if your coins are associated with online gambling, you know, four hops back, they could 
you know, essentially they couldn't take your coins, but they could basically deny you service, send them back, say, we don't want anything to do with you, get your account closed, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens all the time. So what Ricochet does is adds hops of history that aren't associated to anything because they're brand new. Uh, and this relatively simple feature uh, has been in, uh, working since 2015. And we've never got a single complaint about it. It does the job really well. It's very simple, but um, you know, the we it's about understanding our adversary. Now, in this case, our adversary is a chain analysis kind of uh, autopilot program that it's not a human actor. It's it's automatic. It's looking back at the mm -hmm. transaction history on the blockchain. It's saying, is this associated with anything? No, it passes all check marks box. You know, boxes. Boom, move it, move it along. Uh, for that type of check, for that type of um, threat, it's a perfect, it's a perfect tool. So uh, this is especially useful if you're worried about sending a uh, like a whirlpool post mix output. We call it so a, a coin directly from whirlpool to your exchange. You think your exchange might have a problem with that? We haven't seen any exchanges really having any issue, but you know things can change, and you know you can think, oh, maybe they're going to have an issue. Just send it as a ricochet. It will add five hops of history. It won't be an issue. Yeah, it's amazing, and I do. I've used that one a few. Like I say I've used that a few times myself, and it's uh, it's great. And again, it feels cool. It's like a Sparrow. You feel like a like a Bitcoin power user with all the, all the tools you have at your fingertips. You kind of feel like a I don't know a pseudonymous Vanu. I don't know whatever using the <laughs> being silly now, but um, yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing, and obviously easy to use. So I guess a couple more, um, I guess less technical features maybe, um, stealth mode and scrambled pin. Um, could you talk about those? So stealth mode, we were able to bring back finally, um, just late last year. And so our, our original iteration of Samurai, well, the first one that we put out all the way in 2015 included something we called stealth mode. It was completely unique, nothing like it at the time. And what you could do was hide the hide the fact that you had an app called Samurai Wallet on your phone, it would disappear. Um, and the only way you could get it back was by dialing a certain code into your phone. And with the correct code, it would launch the app. Uh, so that was very popular. People absolutely loved it. It was one of our most, most popular features back then. And due to changes at Google in terms of what they did at the Play Store and then what they did on Android, it essentially meant we couldn't do that feature anymore. So we lost it, I believe, in uh, 2018. Hmm. So we just brought it back at the end of last year. Uh, so you can now uh, enable stealth mode in the settings of the wallet, choose a decoy app. And we've built, um, I think it's five decoy apps, uh, like a calculator, a notepad, um, a VPN app, I think, is one of them. Uh, camera, I think, is one of them. And so these are all kind of like innocuous looking apps that you would have on your phone. Um, choose a decoy and the de each decoy has a set of instructions on how to launch the app from the decoy. So for like the notepad, you press you know, the title five times and it will launch the app. Mm -hmm. uh, so we launched that, like I said, at the end of last year, and it's been very popular. People are very happy to have it back. We're happy to have it back. And it's a nice, it's a nice tool to be able to hide the fact that you have a Bitcoin wallet on your phone. Um, you know, it's not going to full forensic examination of your phone, but it will, it will, uh, fool a casual search for sure. Yeah. And that, that's a, that's an extremely valuable, um, valuable thing right now. Um, I won't give details obviously, but there was a, a Venu and Paznian who, um, had his, uh, um, was crossing the border somewhere and got his devices, um, I guess you guys devices oh, searched. That's, so, that's um, I mean, if I ever, yeah, if I'm ever crossing borders again, I will definitely enable that or I will come up with a, a better situation, um, so better solution. Um, but yeah. yeah, that is, a, that is becoming that's a problem now. It wasn't, it wasn't really a problem five years. Like, cause I, I, I had a guy, um, a, call, a friend, uh, Mark Wood, um, who was kind of more, a ca more of a casual developer, still a talented developer, but not like full time. He worked on this, uh, this, this wallet called no wallet. And the idea was this this exact thing. Um, if you ever got to the border and you can't, you don't want to lie to them, obviously. So, like, if they say, "Do you have a Bitcoin wallet?" You can say, "I have no wallet," and you're telling the truth. But um, <laughs> I don't know if that would necessarily work either. But um, it was a uh, yeah, a, a cool idea, and it was a, a, a cool a cool project at least. Um, but uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so scrambled pin, which I guess is more of a basic one, but it's uh, it's a power, it's a really important one. So you know, it's a scrambled pin function. Yep. So this is again, this is one that goes back to the first version of Samurai. Um, it's it's a way of kind of one defeating um, over the shoulder uh, attacks. So someone kind of looking over your shoulder, seeing the way you're hitting your um, your pin screen. Uh, and it also is a screen recorder uh, resistant pin screen as well. Um, so I hadn't seen it in many places. I had seen it somewhere. I forgot where I got the idea for the scrambled pin. It was on a piece of physical uh, security uh, hardware. Um, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I had seen the power of, um, of screen recording and, and malware that, that had, um, you know, taken advantage of, uh, of that particular, uh, attack vector. So I wanted to do everything we could to prevent it. That's why we created a custom, a completely custom pin screen. Uh, doesn't, um, uh, you know, we could control exactly what is put out into the logs, uh, make sure everything, uh, is encrypted when, when you're tapping it. So no other apps can, you know, kind of get in there. Um, and also give no, um, visual feedback of what buttons you're pressing um, because that would give a clue to screen recorders. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm happy to now see that more and more, um, more and more apps are introducing this idea of scrambling the pin. Um, and, I, and I run, you know, and I run um, Graphene um, as one of my Android devices, mm -hmm. which is a D Google version of Android. And they have the ability, you can actually scramble your, your entire phone, uh, phone pin now lock screen. Uh, so, you know, they've introduced that into, into Android itself. So that's kind of cool to see. So I'm happy to start seeing that in the wild now. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, it's fun, funny, funnily enough. Yeah. You, you mentioned, I have, I haven't really seen it many other places. There was a game I used to play, like when I was like a teenager that had been implemented, but I guess Samurai was the last one since then. So yeah, um, everyone, that's I, damn. I kind forgot of exactly where I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I, yeah. I forgot exactly where I saw it before. I, I know I saw it someplace. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could give it appropriate credit, but I, I can't right now. Right. And I just knew, okay, that's kind of, and, and again, my goal was to, to thwart, um, uh, screen recorders and over the shoulder, uh, and, and leaving like, you know, grease marks on your phone, uh, from your fingers when you have a, uh, a pin code or a pattern, it's very, it's kind of easy to see what the yeah. pin code or pattern could be if it's, if the numbers are always stationary. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. So, um, I guess, uh, um, we've talked about, uh, we've talked about paying him. Um, and I guess what we talked about stowaway, what are, what's are, what are stowaways? So stowaway is, um, as I mentioned, a steganographic transaction. And again, this take, this makes use of a second party, a second person, uh, in order to construct the transaction. So this would be a perfect application. If I wanted to send you Shane, some Bitcoin right now. And our wallets would work together um, to create that transaction. The transaction on the blockchain would look as if uh, it was a simple transaction. And I, I described what a simple transaction was mm -hmm. earlier right, in the right. podcast, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm with you. And that's what the power of this stowaway is. It looks like a simple transaction. Um, but in fact, it's a two person, you know, mini coin join essentially. Okay, right, right, right. Um, so this, uh, but the, you know, where, where Stonewall X2 is a type of mini coin join and I can pay to anyone with a stowaway, I can only pay to the person that I'm collaborating with. So in this example, I'm collaborating with you. So I can only pay you. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and I guess the final thing, which was, will segue us into, I guess the, the main conversation, um, one of the, you know, one of the, I don't know, it's. One of the most, I don't know, I guess they're all, they're all used, but Whirlpool, I think, is one of the most important features, um, if I had to choose, that you guys offer. So what's uh, what's the Whirlpool? Sure. Well, Whirlpool is the um, well first impl implementation of what's called Zero Link, which is a uh, Chalmian coin join protocol, uh, Chalmian blinded. Uh, that means that there's a, a centralized coordinator uh, but the coordinator is blinded and can't see what it's coordinating. 
Um, and this allows for uh, non-custodial coin join, uh, non-custodial um, uh, coin join on the main chain. And um, Whirlpool has been in, uh, in use now uh, for, for many years. Uh, 2019, I believe, we started with testing. Um, it's been in use many years. We're at um, uh, multiple wallet uh, client implementations, partners starting to implement Whirlpool and other, um, other wallets as we speak. Uh, so it's something that's really kind of grown and has gathered steam um, and is the current best way to break uh, what are called deterministic links between the past activity of a coin and its future activity. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's, it's one way to think of it is, is, is a process that would, uh, like reforge metal or reforge ingots, right? You bring over a bunch of gold ingots, pour, put it in the forge and the same amount of ingots come out, but they're, they're reformed now, mm -hmm. you know, same amount of gold, same everything, but now it's brand new, not worn and, and torn. Um, right. so that's kind of the, the, you know, best way to kind of visualize what happens in a coin join. Um, and the, you know, the main innovation because, you know, mixers and tumblers have existed on Bitcoin since basically Bitcoin was invented, but the main innovation of Whirlpool is the fact that it's not custodial. So we don't ever take custody of anyone's coins and that's, you know, the most powerful and the most important aspect of it. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, um, what, what the, what I've noticed, uh, I guess two, two, two main critiques, so-called critiques against Samurai. And I guess this would be for any, any, um, I guess, uh, one of them, well, I guess one of them, um, connecting to, um, you know, your guys' node, um, and, you know, giving over the XPUB key apparently, um, because people won't, people don't run their own, not everyone runs their own node. Um, but this can be easily resolved sure. and, um, and when you, when you download the wallet, it's like, it flashes it right in front of your screen. You can't move forward without reading that, um, that like, yeah, you should run your own node. Yeah. Um, so that one's, that one's kind of taken care of. And the other one, which is just kind of, it's a hard problem when you're, when you're talking about coin joins, because liquidity is a, a, a big thing. You got to have a lot of people. Um, so you want to, I guess you a centralized coordinator, one coordinator works better. Um, but it also provides a single point of failure. So I guess that's, that's what you guys, the, I guess the big thing you guys have been working on Absolutely. Um, over at Samurai, right? I guess decentralizing that. Uh, tell us, tell us a bit about that. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And this is something we've been working on for, oh, for a long time. Um, it's how do we retain the benefits of a single liquidity pool, um, which is important for coin join. Uh, you want as large of a liquidity pool as possible, right? Um, you don't want a bunch of smaller silos of liquidity that are competing with each other. You want the largest crowd. So how do you maintain a single liquidity pool, but uh, decentralize the actual coordination of, of the, uh, the coin join, meaning that other clients can run can act as coordinators and every client can act as a coordinator if, if desired um, to remove that single point of failure. So that if for whatever reason we can no longer exist or the servers go down or, or whatever, the Whirlpool can, will live on um, uninterrupted and un, unchanged. Uh, and I think we're close to, to having a, a good handle on that. Uh, we've started implementing, uh, internally for testing, uh, a decentralized Soroban network, uh, and Soroban is what's used to facilitate the communication for the stowaway and the Stonewall X2 transaction that I described earlier. Um, and so we're starting with a decentralized Soroban network and what we learned from that uh, we're going to be applying it to our decentralized whirlpool uh, coordination efforts. But uh, so, yeah, we're, we're advanced along. Uh, it won't be, you know, it's not going to be a couple months. It's going to be longer than that, but uh, it's, we're, we're far along and it's a priority of development for us. And it has been for some time now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's definitely incredible. Um, that's definitely incredible to hear. Um, yeah, and I guess is there. I guess uh, that that is another point that we really that I just kind of blew by. But that yeah, that's another huge privacy bonus with Samurai. Is basically everything is um, all the data is ran over Tor, 
um, in the app. And then yeah. when you're when you're mixing, um, after every single UTXO is mixed, you switch to a, a new Tor identity. Um, so like it's just the the yes. defaults. Um, the, the I guess the I guess the defaults with that are just just incredible. So. Um, yes yeah that's i mean it's essential and and that's why you know one of the reasons why i don't take the the concerns uh, of the the fact that we have a public server that people can choose to to join uh all that seriously it's like look not everyone's going to run a node um you have to be, you have to accept that fact right i mean we want as many people to run a node as possible but not everyone's going to do it and they're going to need to interact with the bitcoin network in some way uh, so no matter what way they interact with the Bitcoin network, they're going to be relying on someone else's nodes if they don't have their own. There's no getting around that. Uh, and we don't believe that it's right that they shouldn't have access to the same yeah, exactly. types of online privacy tools that those who run a node have just because they don't have access to run a node right now. Um, so when it comes to blockchain-based privacy, which is what our main focus is, you know, it doesn't reveal on the blockchain whether they run a node or not. That doesn't get revealed, right? But what could get revealed is prior uh, spending activity being, and that's undesirable, being linked to the transaction they just made. And that could be a big problem for them. Yep. You know, uh, so I don't take that criticism, you know, very seriously because one, we've created all the tools that you need to connect to your own node and bypass hours and we encourage it. We do everything we can to encourage it. Uh, but you know, when the criticism then goes to, well, then you shouldn't provide that service to anyone who doesn't run their own node. Ridiculous, yeah. You know, then I, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I actually get pissed off because it's like, how can you be like, how can you have that, that way of thought? Right. You know, it, it just, it, it's baffling to me. So you know, we're going to continue running, you know, the service and, and, and hopefully those people will, you know, use the product because they need it the most. Um, and, and as I said, they need to connect to the Bitcoin network in some way. And, you know, if they, if they're not connecting through Samurai, which they're connecting to our node, right. They're not connecting to a random node. They're connecting to the Samurai node if they don't have their own and, you know, what, what do they have to trust? They have to trust that we're not logging and that we're not sharing that information. And we say we're not. Uh, what can they do to mitigate? They can enable Tor. They're encouraged to enable Tor. Mm -hmm. So at least their you know, IP information won't be associated on if, if we're logging, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's like, come on. Uh, what, uh, if you're connecting to uh, a random Electrum server, like if you're connecting on Sparrow to a public Electrum yeah. server, I would argue that's, that's worse privacy. Yeah. That's problematic. That's hugely problematic, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's hugely problematic because we know chain analysis is running those Electrum servers. Like they admit to that. That's one of their primary strategies. They run huge number of the public Electrum servers and they're getting a, a large data. number of access. Yeah. Yeah. A huge number amount of data. And, you know, there's not an ex-public site. They don't need it, you know, because <laughs> they're getting the information that they need. Uh, so, you know, it, it focus on, I think people need to focus on, uh, on the bigger picture, uh, recognize that, you know, uh, especially for a mobile wallet, when you first come into the system, you're not gonna, you know, when you first realize you need Bitcoin, you're not going to have a node set up, <laughs> you know, and you need access to the same privacy tools, on-chain privacy tools that everyone else needs access to. And we're going to definitely provide that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a great point. Um, cause it's like uh, we offer the um, do Google, um, do uh, their Pixel Four A's, um, do Google with Calyx on it. Mm -hmm. And I know Graphene is a little better, um, is is a, just is a little better. Um, but Calyx is is a, just a touch more user friendly. So me, I've been using, um, I've been yeah. using mine for like a year, over a year. Um, yeah, coming, I, yeah, it's been about a year. And um, there, it's yeah, like I'm, if you're if you're I'm transitioning, running with Calyx as my daily driver. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's like uh, um, it's like switching over from even iPhone or Apple. Uh, it was easy, super easy. Um, so like j just yeah. the fact that like this, it's that easy to get these phones out to people, and you can literally just like someone who's used a phone before can figure it out. So like it's that's what's important. It's not necessarily perfect. Like there are more perfect solutions, but it doesn't mean that that phone shouldn't exist. You know. So like, I'm right there with you on. Um, so it's kind of a similar argument, I think, um, at least in, in my eyes. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I think Calyx is great. You know, I, like I said, I run a foray with Calyx as my daily driver Yeah. and have done for, you know, a little, a little longer than a year. And it's been, you know, it's a fantastic experience. I have a, uh, graphing, uh, on a three, three a, I think, mm-hmm. uh, that I'm still running. Uh, but I keep that one at home. Um, so, you know, different, different tools for the purpose, different purposes, yeah. but, uh, very happy with the Calyx. It's a great, it's a mm-hmm. great uh, tool. Yeah, and I will mention just as another solution for nomads that I might not have brought up about Calyx, but uh, the Calyx Institute. If you become a member, um, for it's like seven hundred dollars a year, you get a uh, you get a hotspot um, with unlimited data, no throttling. So, and you obviously you can just sign up with a pseudonym or whatever and have it sent wherever. So, as far as like a privacy privacy based internet solution, there's really nothing better. I did just also find out Above Phone offers it like a digital, I guess a SIM card um, for a couple hundred bucks or something like that, but it's not unlimited data, but still, that's another great solution. Um, apparently, I need to test that one out myself at this point, but um, hmm. yeah, I'll just yeah, mention those for the, the benefit of uh, the audience and maybe you too. Um, so, I guess, yeah. um, so speaking in terms of, you know, um, I guess uh, another ramification of centralized or you know how only having uh, you know one coordinator for um, a whirlpool is uh, the tornado cache um, well, I guess it, 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 I guess that could happen regardless but um, I guess these were the, the I guess the, the story is that tor- tornado cache developers um, were arrested in some country in Europe yeah. and basically just held for a month held, held for months or something like that I think it was released finally though yeah. um, maybe I think that's I think that's the last, last news I recall but I haven't followed it followed up on it um, but I guess um do you have any, I guess, uh, any thoughts on that? Just, in, I, I mean, I, I don't really care about Ethereum myself. I've never, I've never interacted with the Ethereum blockchain, but still, just on principle, like they're providing privacy too. Um, if you're going to be, it's, it's the same thing we were talking about. If you're going to be using Ethereum, you might as well have privacy. Um, if you're, if you're going to be using it, so, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, not a good situation, not a good, necessarily a good precedent if they're locking up developers of, um, of coin joining no, projects it was, now. It's really bad. It was, but, yeah. it was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. Um, you know, unprecedented, um, unprecedented in terms of what the um, OFAC uh, did in in sanctioning, you know, the, the contract essentially, and unprecedented in what the enforcement did. And I believe it was the Netherlands that arrested him. Um, okay, that sounds. sounds and right. then held him, yeah, and then held him without, you know, charge not even trial, but without charge for, well, I mean, I, I didn't hear that he was released. Um, I hope he has been, uh, the last I heard he was still oh, uh, okay. in custody, but hmm. you know, it, it, it was shocking to see, um, you know, yeah. we had been thinking about the decentralization of the coordinator before this happened, but this, you know, uh, underscored the importance of moving ahead with that strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, you know, as you mentioned, you know, as it is right now, there's absolutely zero, zero illegal about what Tornado Cash was doing or what, you know, non-custodial um, uh, coin joint does. You know, mm-hmm. uh, the key oh, the key is in terms of custody. The, the centralized and custodial uh, mixers and tumblers are illegal. It is illegal to use those. Uh, those are classified as money launderers. And... Um, you know they they are targeted often, but it, it, you know they're very clear that as long as a service provider doesn't take custody, you know there's nothing illegal about that. That's that's a collaborative transaction between two two parties. Um, right. But that doesn't mean that they can't change their mind or that they can't decide. Hey, you know we're gonna flex our muscles here. Um, you know, so being prepared for any kind of event like that is crucial. And the best way to prepare for that is to make ourselves, you know, unnecessary um, in, in the sense that, yeah, you can you can shut down our servers, you can, you know, break up the team, you can do whatever, but you would need to take down, you know, hundreds, thousands of nodes to stop the, the Whirlpool network from continuing, <laughs> right? You know, so it, it becomes, uh, you know, uh, a race kind of to do that, but, but also, um, an important kind of endeavor and important and and make it, 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 you know, I, I don't think it could have been done, uh, prior to prior to when we, when we're doing it. Right. I think, I think Whirlpool needed to start with a centralized coordinator Mm because it was already so, you know, so 
different, so experimental, so, you know, unproven, untested in the marketplace that you needed to try it this way. And then once it was evident that this is successful in the marketplace, once it starts gaining traction, not only with our user base, with, with other wallets, user bases, and I say, like, okay, you know, this is proven. We need to, you know, we need to strengthen and solidify it. And that's right. where we're kind of, that's the phase we're in right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I guess I've got a couple less serious topics per se. Um, but uh, I do want to make sure um, as far as like, I guess, I mean, in terms of like a, a technical, another technical, to technical topic to cover, but um, you know, like the world's, uh, you know, in some way, the survival society is in, in some way, especially like digital, um, digital privacy, digital, ca digital cash, Bitcoin, things like that are uh, becoming more and more prominent. So I think um, these more, let's say more paranoid solutions, which I'm working towards myself, um, like, uh, offline and cold, more cold storage, um, more, more of those kind of aspects where you could have, you could have a wall completely offline, <clears throat> have it never touch the internet and then, you know, yeah. transfer Bitcoin over to that using, you know, partially, partially signed Bitcoin transactions or, or other, other ways. So, um, like, uh, like if, if, if you're, if you got, uh, you know, Bitcoin that you, you don't want anyone to know exists and never actually touch the internet, um, then, um, you know, like there are solutions out there and Samurai wallets, um, I guess functions with, uh, has some functionality with that. So I guess, uh, yeah, tell us about offline and cold storage functionality for Samurai wallets and maybe about, you know, mixing the cold storage, things like that. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you can definitely, uh, create a new wallet, restore a, you know, an existing wallet, um, without ever connecting to the internet with Samurai Wallet. You know, a lot of, most wallets out there require internet access as a condition of using the wallet, but Samurai Wallet isn't like that. Um, you know, you won't get updated UTXO state information. You know, you won't get up updated uh, fee rate information because there's no connection, but you will see your UTXOs and you will be able to do um, basic wallet management with, you know, with those. And that uh, currently doesn't include um, creating offline transactions like PSPTs, but it will include that, uh, very, very soon. Okay, gotcha. Um, we have, um, you know, we have the leverage of using our other app Sentinel, which is a, uh, a watch only wallet, meaning it doesn't have any private keys. It only has public keys. So it's a nice way to watch cold storage wallets without exposing the private keys to the, mm -hmm. you know, to the internet. Um, we're going to make you, we, we have a really big update for Sentinel in the works that essentially is going to allow you to create transactions for any, um, offline cold storage wallet, um, create a PSVT transactions and sign those transactions with, with a compatible PSVT signer, whether that be you know, um, in Sparrow or in Samurai wallet or, you know, any of the other ones. Uh, so, you know, users are going to have a, a big enhanced offline, uh, functionality very soon in Sentinel. Um, and that will carry over into Samurai in terms of Samurai being a more useful offline, completely offline wallet for those, those users who use it in that way. Nice. Nice. <clears throat> Yeah, that's all. Uh, that's all great. And that was uh, another listener question um, that I figured it would be better to uh, to toss in there as uh, more of a main topic. So yeah, I appreciate that, and I'm sure uh, Josiah will as well. But uh, I guess yeah, no, that's a great question because it's it's one of the things that we you know we wanted to focus on this year is really fleshing out the offline functionality. Oh, oh that's right, a mix to mix to oh, uh, yeah, mix external to cool. wallet as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's another one. So the that's been designed, that's been um, uh, spec'd out. Now it's just in the development pipeline. Um, you know, we've had this in, this is a, a Samurai tool. It's been in the, the Whirlpool CLI basically from day one. Uh, we just never put it into the UI of the wallet. Um, Craig at uh, Sparrow actually introduced it to the market by hooking it up and allowing you to mix to XPUB, or I think that's what he calls it, a mix to external wallet. Uh, and you know, we had, we heard from our users. I said, yeah, we would like to have access to this as well without having to use the command line tool. And, uh, so we're listening, said no problem we'll put together, it will be in the wallet soon. Uh, so that, yeah, we're going to, that's part of, again, part of our broader strategy around, uh, users who want to, um, interact with their cold storage and their offline wallets as well. Uh, but, but remember keeping in mind that Samurai is a spending wallet 
so as long as our our users who transact frequently daily multiple times a day um you know aren't forgotten and you know the, their usage comes first in our view our priority sure. secondarily is you know increasing the usability and usefulness of using samurai as an offline tool uh, which we, we we've learned is being used more and more as an offline completely offline wallet never touching the internet uh, so you know, we we discover the way people use our stuff, and we want to make make their their lives easier. Uh, so that's what we're up to. Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine a couple of years down the road, um, be able to just transact with you know offline, or maybe off, do offline transactions, um, pretty maybe pretty yeah. easily. Um, that'd be that'd be incredible. Um, yeah, definitely incredible. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 like you can do it, but it's limited today. You know, there there needs to be improvement. You know. Sure. You can, you know, if your UTXO state is up to date on your offline wallet, then yeah, you can make an offline transaction. You could broadcast that transaction over Mesh, over you know, uh, using a, another app, uh, using a public node, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as the UTXO state changes, the wallet has no way of uh, getting updated information, you know, without querying a node. So. We have we have plans. We know how to solve this. <laughs> it's just a matter of manpower, and you know, time, uh, you know, hours in the day. But yes, it's definitely on our radar uh, for for our offline guys. Yeah, amazing, amazing. So yeah, I guess um, speaking in terms of of uh, you know, getting samurai um, in the hands of more folks, and maybe even uh, I'm getting maybe even uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, maybe giving getting you some assistance too. Um, maybe have you at, at one of our Pasadena Sekram uh, assemblies, uh, meetings of, the, of our, meeting of our Department of Technology. And um, there's a lot of brilliant folks over there. Uh, Thomas Friedman from Pirate Box. Not sure if you're familiar with that. It's kind of like a, um, um, it's I, I guess uh, IPFS. I guess would be um, would be okay. that realm. Uh, Matthew Raymer, who's uh, who does ContentSafe.co, which is uh, um, like uh, for podcasters or content creators, um, he backs up. Um, they have a really amazing system that he built out with his uh, his team. Um, of like redundant like a basically redundant storage um i guess maybe maybe on ipfs at some point and um you know like uh, there's so many alternative platforms out there for content now um having yeah. like 25 accounts i'm going to publish them on all, all of them is just not feasible so um he said he has a i guess they develop software you just publish it once and it goes out to all those places um using their apis so um there's a lot of really incredible talent there um we had uh, the last last meeting we had uh dave from start nine on um and uh oh, yeah cool. super super deep and great conversation so um yeah it might be might be uh might be cool to have you show up sometime if you'd be uh if you'd be willing yeah sure thing cool and i guess yeah on that note um i'll mention that uh, you know samurai wallet being being the best tool um i guess uh being, i guess being yeah being the best tool out there right now for um yeah, i guess uh, you know android wallets um yeah, definitely. Uh, Samurai is becoming the official wallet of the Free Republic of Pasnia. So, um, obviously, we here here at Pasnia, we're a you know Bitcoin preferred uh, republic. So, um, we encourage people to um, you know transact in Bitcoin, and uh, we want to help you um, help people use uh, Bitcoin privately. So, I'm not sure quite how that looks, but uh, we can def I guess so. Uh, definitely talk about it and and figure that out. But um, yeah, I guess that's uh, one piece of news for for the. That's audience. awesome. Man. That's awesome, and uh, I haven't been I haven't been up that way yet. I know you, you got me an invite uh, last mm -hmm. time we talked. But I need yeah. to take you up on that. Um, you know, do you? I mean, are there people around the accepting Bitcoin, transacting in Bitcoin? Um, just services, or you know, how's it going right now? Um, yeah, just here when people come to uh, um, when people come for our events or people you know um, visit. Um, that's pretty much it. There's not where, where I am. It's still pretty, pretty rural and old fashioned. They still use checks sometimes. Right. So, um, they're not, they're not necessarily okay. up to, uh, up to that. Yeah. I'm sure there's, there's, uh, I'm sure there's some scattered folks, but I just haven't come across them other, other than the, um, you know, the people that come out, out here to Pasadena, which are, which are many throughout the year. So, um, yeah. Fantastic. Yep. For Fantastic. sure. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I think that's great. And I think any effort to, to educate in terms of, uh, Bitcoin privacy, simple, simple concepts, but, you know, just need uh, a few minutes of, of good explanation. Um, we'll do so much uh, because, you, you know, you can do so much damage on the Bitcoin blockchain, exactly, which is public yeah. and, and forever. Um, so ha starting off on the right foundation, I think is, is crucial uh, for, for anyone that you bring on. And, you know, I, we have a lot of our users 
who who express regret like oh i wish i would have known yep. this before i you know jumped head first and this and Me. that and <laughs> yep. it's like look <laughs> it happens right everyone makes mistakes and it's never too late to start but what your responsibility is like now if you're going to bring yep. someone in if you're going to spend the time to onboard someone bring them on the prep um, yeah do it the right way <laughs> you know <laughs> don't make them go through the same shit yep that exactly. you had to go through Exactly. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's definitely true. I will say, um, I did, I did hold stead pretty steadfast. Um, cause I, when I first initially bought Bitcoin, it was, I tried to buy silver. I was, it was just kind of an experiment. If I could buy Bitcoin, buy silver with Bitcoin without, you know, using my pers any personal identifiable mm -hmm. information. And it was a lot harder than you think it would be. Um, it was, it was quite yeah. difficult. I tried, coin I, I tried like a shame. dozen, I had like a, I tried like a dozen different exchanges somewhere out of the country. So I was after there. Um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a nightmare. And I eventually found, um, it's called a uh, Virwox, this virtual uh, world exchange. It's like gaming currency, like world, oh, like, yeah. like second yeah, life Lindens and shit. Um, whatever the F those are. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, uh, you, you trade in your, you just basically it's PayPal. So it's not great, but they, there's no, like, you don't have to like upload a driver's license or anything. Um, but yeah, you just sent, yeah, you sent over with PayPal and then you can do your conversion from second life Lindens over to Bitcoin. And it's like the fees were, were a little high. Um, I will admit that, but, yeah. um, but yeah, then eventually, yeah, I think it was like 2019 or 2020. I just, I checked back out of curiosity and yeah, I knew it, I knew it'd get shut down at some point. So, um, yeah. That had to be, I mean, gosh, that must have been what, 20, 2012 or 2011? Um, uh, it would have been 2015 would be the first, my, yeah, my 2015, first. 2015, okay, yeah. so it was still going, it was still going then. Yeah, yeah that was about the end of the good times, 2015. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was, that's when I consider the end of the good times in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, you know, what was out there, you know. Uh, KYC was like nothing not in anyone's lexicon mm -hmm. at that point yet except for like the lawyers yeah local uh, bitcoins was was space. was a thing then um yeah it was, yeah it, i think that, that's, that's I not think 2015 that's not is when they yeah that's i not think that's anymore. well i think 2015 is when they went kyc like well, started announcing oh, that yeah. you needed to kyc yourself because before that uh you know 2013 2012 they were they were the best local bitcoins was the best you know and it was it was so easy to go from Bitcoin to fiat at, you know, a, even a good, good enough rate. Um, it was, like I said, that was a golden days. Like those like 2013 to 2015, uh, were really, really good. The access to service was easy. Uh, and no one had very good, um, you know, KYC policies yet. Mm -hmm. There's tons of stuff you could get into. Um, all of that stuff. Most of that stuff is gone now. Yeah, I, I will say um, one positive, well, I guess one further innovation that I, I guess I'm kind of surprised is still going forward. I just got just got an email from a couple of days ago, but Coin Debit, um, I I got their their Visa debit card um, as their test program. I didn't get a chance to try it, but other people were were testing it and it was working. But you you um, it's like a Visa Visa debit card, only five hundred dollars at one time. I think is the most you can put on there. Um, there is a limit, but you scan it put the Bitcoin on there, then you can use that card as a debit card anywhere you use Visa. Um, and I, I hadn't heard from them for like six or seven months. They were trying to find a new processor or something. And um, I guess they did. So that, that's also kind of incredible. If it's possible to do that, um, like without any KYC or anything, that's incredible. Um, so it really what is. I've been using lately, mm -hmm. what I've been using lately is uh, they, it's, a, it's an app called the Bitcoin Company. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you can get $1,000 virtual visas. Right. Yeah. Um, without KYC at any given time. And you can use those virtual visas like by adding it to like iPay or Google Pay um, um, in stores that accept touch, like, you know, tapless uh, tap payments. So you can effectively incredible. get a, yeah. But the, you know, the issue for me is I don't have a phone that Google Pay works oh, on. Oh, yeah. That, that's a problem. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's so I had to, I had to, find you know you have to get now a a third or fourth device if you're like me which is your google phone that you you choose to have google on just so you can have google pay yeah <laughs> so you could tap in that places but that's a pretty good access uh to to getting fiat like when needed uh if you're if you're at a place or in a city or in an area that has uh touch touch to pay in stores mm -hmm. or um, even or even gift cards useful. too um, I, 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 yeah, and the gift cards are tried and true, tried and true. Yeah. 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 The gift cards are tried and true. Um, 
the, uh, the the Bitcoin company also has physical Visa cards. If you're in the U.S., that you can get. Um, I haven't tried those yet, though. Uh, but again, that's without KYC, so it's worth a try. Um, yeah, if you're sure. in the if you're looking for the gift card game or the the you know the debit card game, um, which is useful now, it's one of the best ways these days of um, you know going no KYC. Ironically enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, what people in our position are, you know, we choose either choose or by circumstance to, to interact with this, you know, this thing in this way, mm-hmm. um, we, we have to be adaptive, you know, we have to see what's working now because the landscape shifts and changes so much. Um, so, you know, tools that worked last year aren't guaranteed to work this year right yeah you know and you you need to be able to move and and find new avenues and and understand that you know these avenues uh it's just the nature of the of the beast you know the Mm -hmm. most of them will close down most of them will be out regulated out of existence and it's up to you to figure out your next move from there and as someone who's been doing this now who went it all in on bitcoin early uh and have been in this realm uh you know, since, since 20 and the 2012, um, it's a lot harder these days to live on Bitcoin than it was back then. Um, it's possible still, um, to exist in that realm, but, uh, it's much tougher. You know, you have to be Mm -hmm. a lot more, um, you have to keep an eye out for sure, uh, for, for new, uh, uh, methods and ways that are gonna, you know, kind of work for you. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's uh definitely a high turnover rate in the open source uh project space. It's it's definitely worth it. Mm-hmm. It is. No, <laughs> it's it, definitely yeah. worth it. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean it's just it's just you got to build that in with the expectation that you're probably just keep it's probably have to do work on something else after at, at, at some point. So, yeah, just yeah, like you said, it's flexible and adaptive. Um but this does, I guess we're we're yeah. on this conversation or we're, we're on this conversation now and um I'm curious. Um, I interviewed uh, Uri Badnar, who is the uh, co-founder of Parallel and Polis, uh, Polis in Prague, which I think mm-hmm. I think you've been at. Um, but uh, and we were we were talking. Yeah. Uh, we ended our uh, our conversation on I guess Bitcoin privacy and his his thoughts on that. And um, uh, he seems to be more bullish on Bitcoin privacy utilizing Lightning. Um, and uh, I guess the the main argument is obviously the transactions aren't stored on the on chain. So that's a pretty. I guess I guess that's the the main advantage. Um, and that for him, living on Bitcoin is becoming mm-hmm. easier um, using Lightning. So I'm sure you could extrapolate for uh, extrapolate further. Um, now I, t- I take his recommendation seriously because you know as we we're talking about like uh, with um, you know with people that come out here like we use, you encourage using Bitcoin. You you want to. Um, I guess you um, you want people that use Bitcoin. That's kind of what your what your wallet's built for. Um, so he uses it. He's been living on fiat and you know built living on living on Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, operating a business. You know, successful. You know, entrepreneurial ventures. You know, u- utilizing um, crypto. So um, you know, I take it seriously in that way. That like if it works for him, that's what's important. So um, curious for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, do you have any? I guess what, what's your thoughts on Bitcoin privacy and Lightning and and, and that kind of uh, area at this point in, in time. Uh, not not particularly bullish. I think that there's significant privacy um, issues with uh, with receiving on Lightning, uh, for example, um, and the you know the argument that it's more private because it's not stored on the blockchain is true, uh, but that you know to have that uh, opinion is to reject the idea that there's active surveillance going on. Uh, which is naive. There, of course, there's active surveillance going on. Um, you don't need to, you know, consult the blockchain, uh, have it stored for you if you're watching everything, if you're watching each hop, if you're watching entrances and, and exits. Um, and I think it, it's naive to think that, you know, our adversary, which is the chain analysis, aren't doing that uh, or won't do that. Uh, I think right now you're probably able to, you know, and I think this is where he's finding success in, in, you know, working within the cracks of lightning network right now, because lightning network is very small, you know, it's a very small network. Uh, there's a very limited num- amount of capacity. There's not a lot of usage. This is just the reality of the situation. People get, get on, on, mad about it. But if you, if you look at the activity, there isn't a lot of economic activity going on right now. Um, 
it's not a threat. It's no one's, you know, no one's really too worried about it from our adversarial point of view. I think if it was to grow uh, to a point where they need to start worrying about it, it's easier than with on-chain Bitcoin to strangle. Um, I think that you get the intermediaries very easily with Lightning Network. We see it already where the majority of Lightning Network um, is custodial wallets. See, you know, the, the, the plain majority wallet of Satoshi or other custodial wallets. Uh, so uh, that's just the trend. That's the way it's going with Lightning. I think that will continue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not to say that you can't find, like, you know, we were just talking about things that work and, you know, work well for you right now. And by all means, exploit those things. Uh, do whatever you can that works. Uh, it's just not not our focus as Samurai Wallet, as, as the company, to focus on Lightning. Sure. Um, privacy, Lightning tools, because we don't think the foundation is stable. We think that the foundation of Lightning is easily captured. So we don't want to build on that foundation. Nothing against anyone else who does build on that foundation. Go for it. Mm -hmm. But we want to build out the main base chain, that layer, because it's still, you know, there's still, you know, plenty of privacy problems on the main chain. And if we can fix as many of those as possible uh, on the application, using the application layer, then we want to do that. And there's still plenty, plenty of work to do. So, you know, it's a division of labor thing. Lightning mm -hmm. will develop uh, uh, and, and people who are super into Lightning will build the tools on Lightning. And we're going to focus, do the same on, on main chain. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of uh, kind of what I figured, and I, I'm I'm really I've, I just started doing some doing some testing on it because uh, I got um, so there's a company called Voltage, and I'm not just a promo or anything, but um, just the fact that again user friendliness, like if if you can't like if you're out in the homestead and you don't have <laughs> the type of internet to do this sort of stuff right now, um, you can they can host like a BTC pay server or like a Lightning Network node for you. Um, so I've mm -hmm. been, I've been testing out that, uh, mainly for the reason, yeah, BTC pay server, just kind of doing some testing and got yeah, figuring out if this stuff can work. Um, and then, um, there's, uh, I guess the, the podcast 2.0 apps, um, where people can pay like, you yeah. know, hundred sats per minute or something like that. That's a really unique technology. And I want to, I want to definitely want to test that out. Um, and I have been, I've gotten some, a couple, a couple donations that way. So it's been, it's been pretty interesting. Um, not saying it'll be feasible cool. forever, but um, you know the little the, the little time I'm putting into it um, has been has been fun and explorative. So um, I definitely suggest testing yeah, people if people yeah, are interested. Exactly. But yeah, I'm not necessarily um, yeah I'm definitely definitely more bullish on on uh, you know main chain Bitcoin um, and uh, you know as the fallback Monero if uh, if it is necessary. Right. But, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess exactly. on exactly and and that's that's you know another reason. Um, you know why we're we're you know want to focus on the main chain is because look if lightning network takes off like again we don't really see it kind of taking off uh but we could be you know we could be wrong on that not that bet right if it does take off you're still going to want to um exit back to main chain at some point you know you're still going to want to to go back to the base layer and you're going to want to hope to goodness that the the tools and the privacy tools on the base layer are fleshed out are robust mm -hmm. um so, you know, it, it makes no sense not to focus on the base layer, right? You know, and, and that's why we just, we've always just thought that, look, do what you're, what you're passionate about. So as a developer, if you're passionate about Lightning, you think this is going to be it, then go all in and, mm -hmm. and develop, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, worry and care about privacy. Uh, that's, that's all we would, uh, we would hope for, right? Like uh, at the very least do that, but, mm -hmm. but go all in and, and the people who are into main chain are just going to focus on that. And it's going to, it's going to work better together. Um, if, you know, if, if it's successful, if that's the, Certainly. you know, the scaling solution of choice. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely fair. And, um, I guess the, one of the, the new challenges for Bitcoin, maybe, um, I don't know if I call it a challenge, but kind of an annoyance at this time. I'm not sure if it'll continue, but um, there was the recent. Not really even. I couldn't even really explain it. I don't think. Just uh, basically, I guess. Uh, or I guess the, the ordinals um, topic. Um, sure. I guess selling unused space sure. in the blocks um, is kind of the the basic part of that. But people are selling those selling those that spot on the on the chain for you know NFTs and 
um, and JPEGs and things. Sure. Um, yeah. So I guess um, I have noticed. Um, I, you know, I've, I always do. You know, one one you know once Satoshi per byte. I've done that for you know a couple of years and always you know um, sometimes within twenty minutes, sometimes within you know a few hours. It just it usually you know works pretty flawlessly. Um, but I have noticed that uh, the I guess the base fee rate has gone up a touch um, with uh, these uh, so-called ordinals. Um, so I guess what, what's, uh, uh, it's kind of a nonsense topic a little bit. I don't like, like giving attention to it, but it does have an impact on fees, um, or it could have an impact on fees. So I guess, uh, just speaking in terms of just basic, sure. tra- basic transaction fees and then whirlpool fees too, what impact is, does this have on you guys? Sure. Uh, so if you're talking about the most recent, uh, congestion period, uh, we'll call it on today's what March, March 8th. So mm-hmm. the most recent one actually wasn't caused by the ordinal, uh, uh, craze that activity has largely dried up um you know it's, it's not what it was what what the last congestion was caused by was uh binance um oh, okay. binance has horrible horrible um uh you know consolidation practices and they choose the worst time to do it and they fill the mempool up uh <laughs> they they've been doing this for years um okay. it, it okay. usually clears out uh, pretty quickly uh, but this particular case was was Binance, and I think it's I think it's largely cleared out or nearly cleared out now. Uh, but but to go to your your question about the ordinals thing, um, you know, I'm kind of in. I, I I find the whole thing fascinating. I'm not I don't I'm not a hater. I don't hate the idea of it. I don't I don't hate Casey for you know creating it or unleashing it, and I don't think it's evil or anything. That I've seen some pretty wild takes out there. <laughs> I think it's it's relatively fascinating. Uh, from a market economic point of view, right? Uh, and I think you put it best right there uh, in your description when you said it's, you know, selling the unused witness space, right? Um, to, to fill these blocks. Uh, so I think it was fascinating to kind of watch that happen. Uh, and the, you know, the detractors were loud about it. And, you know, uh, some developers, created uh, i think luke uh, luke jr created um some sort of uh, you know blacklisting mechanism to filter or censor these these transactions which he's done in the past like that's not a surprise to, you know that's his go-to move um whatever uh i have more of a problem with that type of response than i do with ordinals themselves right. yeah um you know i i think i i i wouldn't you know mint or buy an ordinal you know, that's, uh, it's just not, I, not what my, my interest is in Bitcoin or why I got involved or anything like that. It's just not interesting to me in that respect. Uh, but it doesn't offend me as much as someone, you know, running a patch on their node, uh, to, to discard these transactions because, you know, that's a slippery slope, you know, what other transactions are now going to be kind of, you know, uh, disallowed. Uh, in my view, and maybe it's naive, but in my view, if a transaction pays the minor fee, then it's a valid transaction. Yeah. It's not spam. Yeah. You know, and whether you agree with it or not, I, that's just, that's my naive kind of view on it. Um, in terms of the impact it's had on the mempool, it was, it was a brief spurt of popularity. Uh, maybe it lasted about a week, but then yeah, usage kind of just dropped it's kind of dropped off now. And, and I think it was interesting how it dropped tremendously during the, you know, the, the Binance increase, uh, the, the Binance led increase in the mempool, um, you know, which, which kind of tells me that the people who are minting these don't, you know, they're not going to mint more than, than, than one sat per byte, right? They're not, they're not going to pay more than that really. Uh, so if they, if it's a successful kind of thing and there's a huge market for ordinals and people are minting like crazy, you know, that will drive the price up of the, the, the base fee rate to above one, one sat per byte. And, you know, no one's going to be minting because no one's uh, going to be paying that, that price. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's a self-defeating kind of thing. I think it will just burn out naturally. Uh, and there's no need to like overreact or anything. We've seen the That's mempool fair. in far, far worse conditions than this. Um, you know, there's been the mempool I feel has been full way more than it's been empty in its life. Um, 
you know, we had from like 2015 to 2018 of this just massive spam attack that just did not end and drove fees to insane. We were, I mean, we're talking mm-hmm. two, 300 Satoshis per byte. Um, and we had that sustained for, you know, months on end. Um, this fad of the one sat per byte has been fantastic for users. Um, fantastic for Whirlpool users in particular. Um, but we, when we launched Whirlpool, the fee conditions were significantly different. We were, you know, we've seen 60, 70, 80 sat per byte fees. Yeah, so Whirlpool can handle it. Users can handle it. Um, users are far more likely to pay, you know, 10, 15 sat per byte Whirlpool transactions than they are to mint 10, 15 sat per byte ordinal transactions. That's my guess. Yeah. I yeah, think yeah, that's, yeah. I think that's true. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I really, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's true. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm with, I'm with you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's, uh, so I, I'm not hugely concerned about it. You know, it's, 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 at least it's something interesting on the coming out on, on Bitcoin. You know, it's kind of an interesting <laughs> project, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's, that's, that's really a good point. There was a huge, uh, you know, um, huge, it was a uh, very popular, um, for for yeah, about a week, and there are, you know a couple podcasts on it that I listened to, and then haven't really heard heard or seen much about it since. So uh, maybe it'll just be a little it'll yeah. be a fad. Maybe it's kind of uh, gone away for for now until fees go really cheap or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Glad, glad you don't think it's well, gonna be I a think, problem. I mean, we should. Be, yeah, we should be back. Honestly, we should be back to like one sat per bite this week, unless yeah, you know, I think we are a big mempool event. <laughs> uh, I think whatever we, we're about like what seven right now. Stuff is still clearing out. But uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not worried about that. Like I said, we've just seen so much worse. In the right. Pool. Yeah. That's that's that's. We that's can handle point. so much worse. Yeah. We can handle so much worse. Yeah. So and and, and you know we're looking at in, in terms of whirlpool, we're looking at um, unspent capacity, and we're looking at number of uh, you know cycles that have been happening um, daily, and we're seeing you know huge numbers, great numbers. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not dissuading people from whirlpooling. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I guess um, one listener question here, um, and I think that might be about it. Um, uh, same person, Josiah, asked about uh, toxic and toxic change. And I guess we can kind of end on, in here on a funny note. Um, you probably saw the screen. I saw a screenshot of a tweet yesterday. Um, of this person claiming that uh, Samurai Wallet didn't have didn't break deterministic links because of the toxic change, um, and that was the best yeah. they could come up with. And it's like, yeah, that's why it's toxic and you can't spend it, or they make it very hard to spend it. So you yeah, know that's why it's called toxic. Up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's like, oh, but, yeah, yeah. They, they got you guys. They got you guys. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, it just shows a fundamental fundamental misunderstanding of. Or hopefully it's it's a misunderstanding and it's not willful, right? Like you have yeah. to you have to benefit the doubt, right? So it's a woeful misunderstanding of how Whirlpool works and what the you know the well not just Whirlpool how Zero Link works, right? Um, which is the protocol that Wasabi was supposed to be built off of and never never did. Um, it, it, it's ridiculous. Look, <laughs> the we we do more than anyone else does when it comes to trying to prevent the user from doing something unintentionally that's going to burn them right and when it comes to toxic change we call it toxic because it is a deterministic link to that whirlpool entrance right that transaction where you entered whirlpool um so by default one that uh that uh toxic change is not included as part of the mix and won't show up in your mix transactions, right? So you won't ever be able to accidentally link it to one of your mixed coins, which is basically the most catastrophic thing that can you can do if you've uh, done a coin join, right? That's the most, it's catastrophic if you take a completely clean coin and now associate your entrance into the coin join with it. Like, you know, that's huge error. So users can't do that. Users have done that multiple times uh, in Wasabi and continue to do it in Wasabi because they don't they they leave it as part of the mix and it's part it's right there able to be spent and the wallet puts it together. The user doesn't choose to do it; the wallet chooses to do it. You know, and mm-hmm. for them to conflate that uh, with the 
the docks, uh, the, the toxic change from Whirlpool, which goes into a separate area, like a containment area, can't be connected, whether the user wants to or not, uh, is is marked as do not spend by default. So the wallet won't won't spend it at all. Um, you know, we we've taken as many precautions as we can to give the user who doesn't have this concept, this knowledge potentially, just to prevent them from shooting themselves in the foot, mm-hmm. you know? And the fact is they, they talk, they, they put this, this trash out there, but they don't do it on Twitter anymore because they'll get corrected. Right. But they do it on Noster because we're not on Noster mm-hmm. and there's only, you know, the most of the people on Noster are kind of like one kind of click, you know, one group. Uh, and no one, very few people will, will call them on it. But if they posted that, you know, where, where actual, like there's a large number of people, they'd be corrected almost instantly. It's like, look, that's not how it works. And why don't you understand how it works? You know, and how come we understand how Wasabi works better than you understand? Like, it's just, it, the whole thing is crazy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I know that we've had large, long time beef with Wasabi. But as far as I'm concerned, they completely capitulated and off themselves when they bent the knee and implemented um, chain analysis into their coordinator. You know, when that happened, it was like, is it? It's not even worth, you know, this fight anymore. These guys are, you know, no one can take them seriously. Anyone taking them seriously at this point after that move, you know, in my view, is hopeless. You know, you can't be a privacy tool. You can't, you know, be a coin join tool. Uh, and implement and partner with, you know, your adversary that you're trying to prevent uh, leaking data about uh, mm-hmm. your users to, and partner with them. Like that defeats the whole <laughs> the whole purpose, you know. Um, when that happened, I was just like, "That's it," you know. They lost. That's that's absurd. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely with you. So I guess um, the the uh, que- the question regarding uh, toxic change that was a, a really really good uh, discussion there. But um, I guess uh, yeah, what he, he I think we meant, we might have talked about it last time. But uh, yes, what to do with toxic change? Uh, gift cards, yeah. uh, Monero. Um, I guess the secondary yeah. option is on the progress. Is uh, like or, so yeah. I guess that was his question. And my addition is um, a secondary question on the progress of uh, atomic swaps. If you if you know of any. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's really where where it comes down to. Uh, you know, it's it's a tough question to answer for your user, uh, for your listener. Um, basically, people have different strategies when dealing with the with the toxic change. So first and foremost, if the toxic change is a large enough amount to be added into a smaller pool, you should definitely do that, right? So if you have like a um, a 0.0015 uh, BTC toxic change output that can go into the 001 pool, right? So by all means, go into the next smallest pool um, should be one. If it, if you can't, then yes, you could either just you know mark it, do not spend, ignore it until a better option to to deal with it exists. You could spend it at uh, for gift cards. You can swap it into Monero using one of the centralized swappers that exist out there, understanding that there is a risk in doing that. Um, you can, uh, I, I, know, I know there's some people that go into the Lightning Network um, in, in some capacity. I'm not sure exactly how that works for them, um, but they seem to be very happy with their flow. So, you know, there, there's multiple methods out there and it kind of goes back to what I'm saying Um about just kind of being aware of what options are available, right? Like it might be really a nice way to, to load up on, um, you know, gas, uh, you know, gas gift cards, right. Uh, with your toxic change, if you can load them up into a, an app and save them up until there's a certain amount that you can exchange for a credit, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's custodial, there's a risk, but the risk is small. They don't have your identity. And they're probably not going to steal your, you know, your small amount of, of, you know, credit or whatever. Yeah. So, so, so we, we've given people so, a lot of, a lot of solutions it. in that, and that, and I'll mention um, one of the centralized ones that I've used and a potential strategy for people, um, simple login, or I guess a service like that, where you can have a new email address for uh, like created 
right. um, to, like do you know separate it from your identity as much as you can, and that, or I guess as, yeah, as, all yeah. that as much as you possibly can, and then something like Changely, um, I'm su- I'm surprised yeah. Changely still exists um, in this in the capacity that it does, but um, it's a very easy, yeah. very easy, safe and reliable service. I've been using it for like five years or so, so um, you know hopefully it, hopefully yes. it sticks around. Yeah. I mean. Th- the the issue with and I, I'm a happy user of uh, of those types of services as well, Changely and um, Majestic Bank and various other ones, um, you know. And I, I don't disparage them at all, but there is risk there, right? There's risk sure, of yeah. shock on KYC. They could come to you and say, "Look, we need you to KYC before we can do this trade." There's a risk that you know they just one day exit exit scan and they they steal all the coins that they have on them, and you're caught up in that. Uh, and that's why we're focusing on. Um, developing out infrastructure for a, to, um, a cross-chain atomic swap between Monero and Bitcoin. Because uh, we see that as a, uh, well, a great way to deal with the toxic change, right? You can get your toxic change out of your Bitcoin wallet, cross-chain into a Monero uh, without giving up custody of your coins to a third party. So no risk of shock and KYC, no risk, yeah. no counterparty risk. Um, it's a huge innovation if we can pull it off. Um, and I think we can, so we, we are actively developing this. We have, um, one and a half guys working on this full time, um, to make this happen, but it's a big part of our strategy, uh, as a nice method of dealing with the toxic change problem. So that's why I said for some people, it's just as easy as forgetting about it until a better, better option exists, right? Like they'll deal with these later when, when that cross chain atomic swap functionality exists. So that's a, that's a totally viable strategy as well. Uh, there's lots of different options for, for people out there to deal with their toxic change. Yeah. And I guess speaking to the Monero for a moment, I saw, um, and this is kind of one reason that I like the reason that kind of turned me off about Monero is all of the changes, um, like the, the hard fork changes um, are kind of annoying, but it seems like that might be coming coming to an end. But there's going to be one more major um, change to the protocol, I thought is what I what I heard. They're changing the protocol completely. Um, so um, but I think one of the if I recall reading that um, reading that uh, that post about her, that's uh, yeah, that announcement, I think it, it might um more enable atomic swaps between Bitcoin. Um, so, oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. There, I'd have, there I'd have to look into changes. it. But that's, that is true. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to refresh myself. Yeah, Maybe I'll yeah, find that, it and put that it in the channels. But yeah, I think that's the last, yeah, last time. Yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not up to verse on the whole Monero world. Uh, I do I do believe that that's true, that there, there needed to be some changes um, before cross-chain could be fully realized on the Monero side. Uh, on the Bitcoin side, our tooling is pretty much there. Um but yeah, you know, I see it as a, a I think there's, there, we have every reason to believe that the privacy that's touted on Monero is in fact true, um, that it's a very, very good implementation of a privacy coin um, and that we would be silly not to make use of it uh, where possible. But I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, our passion is and remains with Bitcoin. We want to we, we want to see Bitcoin in, the, in its most private state. Uh, yep. So we're you know we don't have any plans of, of changing that. Uh, in fact, I don't. It's kind of some people sometimes will say, "Well, why don't you go work on the narrow then if you care <laughs> you know about privacy so much?" And it's like, well, there's not as much value for us to add on the narrow. Like, there's way more value for us to add. Uh, and bringing privacy tools to Bitcoin because one, there's more Bitcoiners, but two, the privacy state, like the default privacy state is so low that you can make, you know, small actionable improvements that have big outcomes, mm-hmm. you know, and, and when you're trying to, you know, uh, when you're trying to make these privacy goals, you're, you're trying to have as big of an effect as possible. Right. And that's, doing that on Bitcoin is where you do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're, you know, we're, we're here to stay on Bitcoin. Um, Samurai wallet will remain a Bitcoin only wallet, uh, but users will be able to uh, swap their Bitcoin into Monero and back from Monero to Bitcoin. Um, you know, once, once that feature set and tooling is built out, that's, that's the primary goal of ours. And we think it's a huge, huge step, like a huge step into that, that um, digital safe haven realm where you can where you can cross uh, atomic swap uh, assets across chain without permission 
And, you know, that's huge. And we're, we're only just starting to scratch the surface of what that world opens up to us. So, you know, I'm, I'm very bullish, very bullish on that. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we've been going for, uh, for just over an hour and a half and covered a lot of ground. Um, so I think we'll, we'll go ahead and start, start to close out here, but, uh, I guess any closing thoughts, anything you'd like to, uh, any links or resources you'd like to point people to, uh, before I let you go. Wow. That went, that went fast. Uh, <laughs> certainly. Yeah. Hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll just point people to the website, uh, samurai wallet.com S A M O U R A I wallet.com. Uh, you'll find out the information you need to about us. Um, and if you're interested in, in stepping up your Bitcoin privacy gain, a uh, game, uh, we have a series on YouTube. Um, I think it's uh, seven videos, all of them less than 10 minutes long that really give a great deep dive introduction to, um, privacy on Bitcoin, understanding the core concepts of Bitcoin. So you can understand how to interact privately with it. It's not intimidating. It's really easy to digest. And I recommend anyone who wants to get started uh, interacting with Bitcoin in a private way, watch these videos and you'll be put onto the right uh, path. And and Shane, if you want to, you know, use those videos in any of your uh, materials, feel free to um because it's one of our one of our users a fan of us put together these videos you know we didn't ask him to do it he just did it Mm -hmm. and they're so great um they really uh give you a firm solid understanding without being overly technical i can't recommend it enough so check out our youtube subscribe to us on there and and check out the bitcoin privacy series on our youtube fantastic awesome well that's uh that's all great. Thanks for your time today, uh, SW. We'll uh, obviously be in touch, and uh, we'll have to get you back on um, when, uh, when I guess, maybe another another six or seven months with the, the pace things are going. Yeah, we'll sure. See. So. All right, man. Thanks uh, for having me, Shane. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Hey, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. Um, all right, guys, and there you have it. Uh, SW from Samurai Wallet, uh, an amazing tool bringing Bitcoin privacy to the second realm. Uh, before letting you go, I'd like to remind you about our first event here at Veritas Pasnia, taking place from April 13th to 17th. Uh, all vetted Pasnians and self liberators are encouraged to attend. Uh, if you need help getting vetted or have questions, uh, please email coordinator at pasnia.com. Uh, secondly, I've talked a lot about the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest over the years and uh, how nothing really um, in my life would be the same without it. Uh, it's also somewhere you can come out and meet us and uh, get vetted to come out to, say, Vanu Fest. Uh, this year's MPL Fest is from July 27th to 31st uh, in Gaines, Michigan. Uh, tickets are on sale now, but prices do go up on uh, May 1st. So go over to mplfest.org, uh, mplfest.org, and obviously be, a link will be in the show notes, and uh, get registered today. Uh, you can even save 10% when you when you pay with Bitcoin. Uh, and hopefully it's some uh, coin-joined uh, private Bitcoin, maybe a ricochet at this time or something. I don't know. You can figure that out. Um, but I think that's all I have for you today. Vanupodcast.com is a place to go for all things Vanu. LibertyInterTech.com for books, privacy tools, uh, or if you're an author looking for help with the publishing uh, process. Uh, and finally, Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A.com for all things the free republic. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Always remember, Vanu is yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Vanu means relative physical and vulnerability to coercion. Vanu is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. Vanu is somewhat like freedom or security, but those words mean many different things to different people. Rather than argue about what those words ought to mean, I speak of Vanu. Coercion includes murder, mayhem, slavery, robbery, rape, extortion, pollution, any physical interference with peaceful activities of another, whether by individuals or organizations. Coercion, especially institutionalized forms such as war, regimentations, and taxes, is one of the major problems of mankind. Practically all past attempts at solution have been top-down efforts to change society as a whole. Since the days of Babylon, there have been countless attempts to reform governments, take over governments, destroy governments, and manipulate public opinion. At most, such efforts bring temporary relief. Usually they have little effect. Often, they make matters worse. Vanu Life represents a different approach to the problem. Vanu Life does not waste space scolding government officials or proclaiming how society ought to be. Vanu Life speaks to you as an individual or small group and suggests ways you can avoid exploiting and being exploited. As you reduce the vulnerability, not only do you help yourself, indirectly you also help others by decreasing support of criminal institutions. Vanu is not necessarily only a few. 
Vani will expand as there are more people willing to do. A Vanuan is a person who has achieved relative invulnerability to coercion. There are many kinds. Some live in the wilderness, where outsiders rarely go. Others live under the earth. Others move from place to place, living in vans, campers, buses, boats, or tents. Some have been Vani for ages, people such as gypsies, mountain men, hobos, seminoles. Others are recent refugees from the dying cities. This issue describes some of the equipment and techniques used. In future issues, I hope you will add your knowledge to what is in here. Vanu life. How to live and let live. Out of sight and mind of those unwilling to let live. By people who are doing it. To order your paperback copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Vanu life. Or to download this publication for free, visit vanupodcast.com forward slash VL.